This is Mrs. Mafucci, and it's time to consider the chemistry of acids, bases, and salts. If you've ever eaten a lemon, you're familiar with the sour taste of lemons. That's because lemons are made up of citric acid. Citric acid is a sour tasting substance. In fact, sour taste is one of the general properties of all acids. Now coffee, on the other hand, contains caffeine, which is a weak base. That is why coffee can sometimes be really bitter. Bases, in general, have a bitter taste. Well, let's consider the general properties of acids and bases. Number one, acids taste sour. Number two, acids turn blue litmus paper red. Number three, acids react with active metals like iron, zinc, aluminum, magnesium, to produce hydrogen gas. Number four, acids react with bases in a neutralization reaction. And number five, acids conduct electricity when dissolved in water. Let's consider the general properties of bases. Number one, they taste bitter. Bases turn red litmus paper blue. Bases feel soapy or slippery. That's because they react with fats to make soap. Bases react with acids in a neutralization reaction. And lastly, Bases conduct electricity. Aqueous solutions. Solutions that can conduct an electric current are called electrolytes. HCl, NaOH, and NaCl are strong electrolytes. Acids, bases, and salts are strong electrolytes. And that's why we study them together in a single unit. When a conductivity meter is placed into a solution of an acid, base, or salt, the light bulb lights up. That's because they completely dissociate or ionize to produce ions. The presence of free ions is necessary for something to conduct electricity. Now, some aqueous solutions do not conduct an electric current. These are known as non-electrolytes. And they do not conduct electricity because no ions are formed when the substance dissolves in water. Organic compounds or molecular solids do not break apart into ions when they dissolve in water. For example, sugar. You know that sugar is soluble in water, but the covalent bonding between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen cannot be broken, and the sugar does not break apart into ions when it dissolves in water. That's why sugar is a non-electrolyte. Well, let's consider now how ions are formed in aqueous solutions. How ions are formed depends on the type of chemical bonding that holds the substance together. For example, bases and salts are held together by ionic bonding and produce ions in a process called dissociation. During dissociation, the electrostatic attraction between the oppositely charged ions is broken. When salts dissociate in water, 
they separate into cations, which have a positive charge, and anions, which have a negative charge. The more ions that are formed, the stronger the electrolyte. So let's consider the dissociation of sodium chloride, magnesium chloride, and aluminum chloride in water. When sodium chloride dissolves in water, it breaks apart into the sodium plus one ion and the chloride negative ion. The water breaks the electrostatic attraction between the sodium ion and chloride ion, and they are allowed to separate. In order for you to know the charge of each of the ions, you must go to the periodic table. So go look up sodium right now. Do you see that in the upper right hand corner, sodium has a plus one charge? That means when sodium chloride dissolves in water, it makes the sodium plus one ion. Now go look at chlorine. If sodium has a plus charge, the chloride ion must be negative. Positives combine with negatives. That's why the chloride ion has a charge of negative one. Notice that when sodium chloride dissociates, it produces one sodium ion, one chloride ion. Well, now let's consider magnesium chloride. When magnesium chloride dissociates in water, it produces the magnesium ion. Go look on your periodic tables. Magnesium has a plus two charge, and we already know now that chloride is a negative one charge. Notice that I don't use a subscript, Cl2 negative. That species does not exist. The chloride ion is a monoatomic ion, but if you look at the formula, magnesium chloride is MgCl2. In order to have two chlorines on the right side of the equation, I put a coefficient 2 in front of the chloride ion. Notice in this dissociation reaction, one particle of magnesium chloride dissociates into one magnesium ion plus two chloride ions for a total of three ions. Now let's look at aluminum chloride. When aluminum chloride dissociates in water, it forms the Al3 plus ion and three chloride ions. Notice that there are a total of four ions produced when one aluminum chloride dissociates in water. Look at this diagram that shows the dissociation of sodium chloride. When sodium chloride dissolves in water, the electrostatic attraction between the sodium ions and chloride ions is broken and the ions separate as they are surrounded by the water molecules. It's important to know that it's soluble salts that are strong electrolytes. Soluble salts are strong electrolytes because they readily dissociate as they dissolve in water. Insoluble salts are non-electrolytes because they do not dissociate when they dissolve in water. Consider, for example, the dissociation reaction for aluminum fluoride. Aluminum fluoride is an insoluble salt, which means that it establishes equilibrium with its ions. Its equilibrium lies to the left favoring the formation of solid aluminum fluoride. And even though it has the potential to produce one aluminum ion and three fluoride ions, 
for a total of four ions on the right side of the equation, it does not. Because aluminum fluoride is insoluble, it does not readily produce ions. Therefore, it is a non-electrolyte. Well, what about the dissociation of bases? Bases are also held together by ionic bonding and dissociate in water. They separate into cations and hydroxide anions. And the more ions that are formed, the stronger the electrolyte. Let's consider the dissociation of sodium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, and aluminum hydroxide. When sodium hydroxide dissociates in water, it produces one sodium ion and one hydroxide ion. It's important to notice that the oxygen and hydrogen do not separate in the hydroxide ion. That's because the oxygen and hydrogen are held together by covalent bonding. When magnesium hydroxide dissolves in water, well, it's not very soluble and instead establishes equilibrium. It has the potential to produce two OH ions and one magnesium ion, but because it's insoluble, it lies to the left and there are more solid magnesium hydroxide particles than there are ions. The same thing is true for aluminum hydroxide, which is also very insoluble in water. It does not readily dissociate to form aluminum ion and hydroxide ion. In general, the more soluble a base, the stronger the base it is. The group 1 metals are referred to as the alkali metals. The name alkali means base. As the solubility of bases increases, the strength of the base increases because there are more OH anions produced. And because they're insoluble, magnesium hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide do not completely dissociate and establish equilibrium. Therefore, they are both considered to be relatively weak bases. The more soluble the base, the stronger the base.